On this episode, we drop in on the Trail Link Conference in Minneapolis. Then we travel to Edwardsville, Illinois to learn about bicycles and engineering. A cyclist in Salt Lake City wants better bicycle education. Finally, we talk with the head of the Active Living Partnership in Omaha. Stay tuned. We're in Minneapolis, Minnesota, talking with Keith Laughlin, who's president of the Rails to Trails Conservancy. What is the RTC? The Rails to Trails Conservancy is a national membership organization dedicated to converting abandoned rail corridors into multi-purpose trails. You've just finished up a very busy week here in the Twin Cities. What's been going on? We've had a conference here of over 500 people from uh, around the country and actually around the world. And we've been focusing on many issues related to both developing, using, and maintaining trails. Was the theme this year a bit different than some of your previous conferences? What was new this year? I think one thing that was new this year is we're really focusing on trail systems. In the past, we have uh, focused on building individual trails, but now we're to the point where we have almost 15,000 miles of rail trail across the country, and these trails are beginning to, to turn into systems. And that's really important because they have the uh, uh, ability to someday become a non-motorized transportation system, and that's our goal. What's the difference between a system of trails and just a bunch of trails? What, the, what, 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 I, What's a characteristic of a system? Well, I think what's really important in terms of what's an effective system is a system that connects destinations. It, it links places that people want to go. That could be home, that could be work, that could be school, that could be leisure. But it's a way of people getting to the, in between those place, uh, places without using a car. And well, we've been here up in uh, Minnesota. Congress has been busy down in Washington. What's been happening down there? Well, we're at the end of a very, very long process in terms of passing a new national surface transportation bill. And we've been working on this for three years, and we are delighted that in the last two days the bill has passed both the U.S. House of Representatives and the United States Senate and has been sent to the president for his signature. Now, uh, assuming he signs it, and I guess most people expect he will, uh, what are some of the provisions in the, in the bill that are you know, that are good for trails? Well, I think one thing, there's two things I guess I would stress. One is, is that we were able to protect everything that we already had going into this bill in terms of programs that already existed to encourage trails and trail building. In addition to that, we were able to secure some new exciting programs. For instance, the Safe Routes to School program. that will be funded at over $600 million a year that will be able uh, to in communities across America to encourage walking, biking, and the use of trails. Why, why is Safe Routes to School important? What difference does it make uh, for our children? Well, I think that there's become growing uh, interest and understanding in recent years about an obesity epidemic among America's children. And part of that is, is that the vast, vast majority of our children are now driven to school. It's considered unsafe uh, in, in many different ways, either from traffic or, or, the, or from a safety standpoint, for children to walk or bicycle to school. And what this program is really trying to do is to turn that around and to help create, uh, in a new generation of, of Americans, the habits of walking and biking. And looking forward, uh, because of all the extensions, it's actually not going to be six years till the six-year bill is up. Uh, I mean, you haven't really had time to sit down and think about it yet, but what would you expect you'd be looking for uh, in the next bill rather than just defending what you already have? Well, we want to be much more uh, ambitious in the next bill and that we are ready to launch a 2010 campaign so that by the year 2010, when the next bill comes up again, that we want to double federal investment in trails and walking and bicycling because we think the, the support is out there in America's communities and we think the need is great and it's time that we began to invest in this kind of infrastructure. And you have this vision of the year 2020. Uh, what's, what's, what's your ultimate vision? 
But we have what we call our BHAG, which is our big, hairy, audacious goal. And that is by the year 2020, we want 90% of Americans to live within three miles of a trail system. And we think that if that kind of, of goal is met, it will really give the American people the opportunity to build walking and cycling into their daily lives. We're in Edwardsville, Illinois, talking with Greg Luttrell, who's with the Department of Civil Engineering at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Where do bicycles fit into your teaching? Oh my, bicycles end up being critical. They're uh, one of the modes of transportation. So in covering all of the modes of transportation, that's one of them I talk about. Um, and try and focus on it as a viable alternative. Um, something that most of my students have not been on since they got a driver's license. Most of them are coming from rural areas where bicycling is not necessarily a viable option. And letting them know that do, people do commute. You know, we've got a good set of trails around here that that is still an option, even if you are, are a college student or even if you're somebody older. And you teach a, a course at, uh, is it at the graduate level that deals with uh, bikes, peds, and, and what else? course called Transportation Alternatives. I teach it every other every other spring. It's called Transportation Alternatives. Um, covers bicycling, walking, and transit. And looking at you know how to do good trail design from a pedestrian standpoint, Americans with Disabilities Act. Spend a lot of time most of the semester dealing with bike trails and bike facilities and you know bike safety and all of those sort of issues surrounding being on two wheels. And then we'd spend the last part of the semester on transit. Now when you when you look at bikes on bike trails. Uh, what do we know and what do we not know? <laughs> we know it's fun, we know it works, and we don't know a whole lot uh, is, is what it fundamentally boils down to. A lot of the design guidance uh, by AASHTO, American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, uh, is, is basically says take auto design standards and somehow apply them to a bike facility. And what we're doing with research here is kind of saying, well, that might work and it might not apply. And so one of the projects we did a couple years ago was with the Illinois Department of Transportation looking at best construction and maintenance practices on trails throughout the state. The state was spending millions of dollars building trails, watching them disintegrate a very short time later. And they wanted us to come in and take a look at it and, and tell them why. And what we found was the design wasn't tight enough because designers don't understand the idiosyncrasies of being on two wheels versus four. The uh, construction was not being done, again, tight enough uh, because it wasn't being inspected well enough and the inspectors don't understand the needs of, of bicyclists. And the materials that were being used, just a lot of times, they're not reacting the same way to bicycle travel that they would to automobile travel. For instance, uh, asphalt, the most common trail surface that we find. An asphalt road gets, gets sort of massaged by vehicles and so it's constantly being rejuvenated because of the, the tires on, on the cars, on the, on the trucks and the cars put that same surface on a bike trail, well bicycle tires, one, aren't big enough, two, don't weigh enough to redo that rejuvenation, and so the asphalt literally self-destructs. So the environmental factors end up causing the failure, not heavy loads, things like that. And so there's just a whole different set of, of circumstances that occur on a bike trail that we don't understand. Uh, the design guidance says, well, do something that looks about like a road and hopefully it'll work. And in a lot of cases it doesn't. How difficult is it to, to do this sort of research, to find out what is uh, needed for a, an asphalt bike trail? Um, in a lot of cases, it ends up being very difficult because the focus isn't there. People still, some of the policy deci the decision makers still think of, of bicycles as a kid's toy. They don't realize it's a viable transportation source. More often than not, it's because the trail managers, the, the policy makers, the people that have the money don't understand they're not bicyclists. So they don't understand the specific needs of bicyclists. Um, an example we got into from a safety standpoint um, with some bike clubs up near the Quad Cities in northern, northeast, northwestern Illinois dealt with bollards in the center of trails. The bicyclists were running into them, and the trail managers were saying, well, we've got them painted yellow. You, they're very visible. Well, and they were correct. Standing there looking at them, they were very visible. None of the trail managers were bike riders. Well, riding a bike looking down they're not visible because none of the advanced striping had been put in. It's those little details that if you're a bicyclist and you understand the needs are obvious, just blatantly obvious. If you're not a bicyclist, you kind of don't understand why they're even necessary. 
So that perspective makes trying to get the message out there of why the research is important, it makes it very difficult. The other problem we've had relative to some safety research is um, that a lot of that research needs to come directly from the bicyclist. Yeah, which, uh, yeah, when we look at the safety statistics on bicyclists, um, from a, wh where does the existing data come from and, and why doesn't it work? If you, if you pull that data up from any of the federal sources, they're going to tell you that we kill about 600 bicyclists a year. We injure about 45 to 70,000 a year. And those are numbers, again, that are federally put out there. Everybody buys into those. The problem is those represent motor vehicle crashes and emergency room visits. Well, those are two very specific results of bicycle crashes, and they also only represent less than a third of all bicycle crashes. Two-thirds of the bicycle crashes don't end up with anybody getting killed and don't end up with anybody going to the hospital. And so all of our policy, all of our safety focus is based on this small select sample, and we're missing the rest of it. One of the issues is the only, re the only way to get the data on the rest of it is to go talk to bicyclists. And so there's all sorts of sampling issues with you know, people's memory and time lapses and, and recollections and dealing with that. The problem is that's where the data lies. You've got to go ask the bicyclist, okay, when did you fall? How did you fall? Why did you fall? Give me all the details, and then let's put all that together and see what that safety situation looks like compared with the safety situation we're dealing with from those federal statistics. And, and, and how does the safety picture change then in terms of you know, leading cause of crashes? It ends up being totally different. Uh, if we look at the, the top reasons for that the federal government says and all of the safety, safety groups buy into for people crashing, it's you know, running stop signs, getting hit by a car, tur illegal turns, getting hit by a car, whether it's the bicyclist or, or the vehicle, those sorts of things. And, and those types of vehicle-bicycle interactions account for 90% of those 645,000 crashes I talked about. If we talk to bicyclists and say, okay, you didn't go to the hospital, you may or may not have gone to the hospital, but you weren't hit by a car, how or why did you crash? What we find is 28% of those crashes were caused by interaction with other bicyclists. Somebody cut them off, they swore if they bumped, those sorts of things. 27% was caused by debris, just miscellaneous stuff on the pavement. Um, the, the, rest, the rest of the causes end up, major causes end up being cracks and potholes excessive speed going down hills, you know, going too fast, turning too sharp, um, animals, and rider inattention. Well, if we look at all of those causes, those are totally different than any of the causes the federal government is putting out there. So we've got these two sets of accident causes which don't overlap in any way, one of which is being addressed through all of the federal policies, one of which is this unknown out there. So we've been doing research talking to, directly to bicyclists, trying to quantify the majority of accidents that are, that are occurring, saying why are, these, why are these occurring to see if we can push the, the whole safety spectrum to say let's address all of the bike crashes, not just the ones where the data is easy to get. Now when you working with students, looking at possible paper topics, uh, how interested are they in, in these bicycle issues and, uh, and is there a lot of good research they can do? Early on they weren't because again, coming from a rural background, most of our students come from the St. Louis area and the, and the surrounding rural communities, they just don't have an interaction with bicycles. I've been here a few long enough now that they understand that when they come work with me, they're going to do bicycle research and, I, and I'm sort of getting some momentum built and more and more of them are coming to, to talk to me about it. What we're getting into and what we've learned is that there's a, there's a, level, there's a lack of basic fundamental research in the bicycle area. Um, do we understand how a bicyclist turns a corner? You know, what radius do they turn? How, what, what, what is their lean angle? No, we don't. Well, that's critical when we design curves and trails. It's critical if we're looking at intersection design. Do we understand how the, pa how the tire pavement friction situation exists? No, we don't. In fact, if you look at the federal design standards, they say, well, use friction factors from automobile tires, but realize that if there's debris or water on the pavement, that friction factor is going to go to zero. Well, we're starting with a guess and we're saying, well, it might be something else because nobody's done that basic research. So I've, I had a student this last summer that actually co began collecting those coefficients of friction and they're radically different than automobile tires. I don't know what that's going to mean. That's kind of the exciting part for me. It's the exciting part for my students is we're getting down to that basic level where we're asking the questions 
knowing that the results, we don't know what the results are going to be, but then also not knowing where those are going to lead. You know, but knowledge is good, and we've got to get the knowledge out there to be able to make the, the whole bicycling world a little better. We're in Salt Lake City, talking with Travis Jensen. Do you ride your bike much? I do. I, in fact, it's my mode of transportation. I got rid of my car about three months ago, and so I walk, take the public transportation system, and ride my bike to work, to school, um, to shopping, pretty much everything is done by bike. And as a, a cyclist who gets around a lot, uh, what sort of problems are there with cyclists in traffic? Um, well, there's a long list of problems with cyclists in traffic. I think most of them, though, could be fixed through better education. I think if the motorists and, and the bicycle riders knew better how they were supposed to be doing what they're doing, then I think a lot of the problems could be solved. Um, and fortunately, education also doesn't require expensive infrastructure. It is hard. It takes a lot of outreach, and it takes a long time to get the word out. But I think it's uh, probably the most effective way that we can go about making it safer for people and cars, bicyclists and cars, to coexist. I've noticed, uh, well, I think you can approach that from two angles. There's obviously the education of the motorists, which is important to, to help them understand, because not everybody understands how bicyclists are supposed to fit into the mix of traffic. A lot of drivers just think that we're a nuisance and they don't understand that we're supposed to act like a vehicle, and that creates misperceptions when they don't know what to expect out of us that can create problems. On the flip side, there's a lot of improvement, a lot of improvement that could be made on the bicyclist side, and people just need to also realize from a cyclist standpoint what they are supposed to be doing out on the road, how they're supposed to ride, what they are supposed to do, what they are not supposed to do, and that they're supposed to act like a vehicle. Um, you see a lot of people putting themselves in danger and other cyclists in danger by not obeying the traffic laws, thereby doing two things. Number one, making motorists upset and more aggressive towards you, and also if the cyclist isn't doing what they're supposed to, then that further create, further exacerbates the problem of motorists not knowing what to expect from us. If there was a clear message from the cyclist being shown on the road, a clear example, then motorists would know what to expect out of us and we would all be safer. And what are, what are some of the common mistakes uh, uh, you know, a poorly educated cyclist would be making out on the road? Well, that brings up two things. I will, I'll answer your question, but first I want to just make one distinguishing uh, remark, and that's that there are, it's not just an education problem, it's also an action problem. A lot of cyclists do understand that they're not supposed to do certain things and that they are supposed to do others, and they still disobey the law even though they are aware. So to answer your first question about what some of the common mistakes are, riding on the wrong side of the road. There's a lot of people who were taught and rightfully so. When they're young, when they're pedestrian, you should walk on the sidewalk or the side of the street facing traffic because you're slow moving, you can see cars coming at you better. And so they translate that into bicycle riding as well. And a lot of people ride on the wrong side of the road because of that previous teaching about how they're supposed to be a pedestrian. Um, obviously with a bicycle it's a different story because you can be going 15 or 20 miles an hour the opposite direction you're supposed to be going and with cars turning out it's not like a pedestrian where you're going so slow you can react quickly. So I would say wrong way riding is a big one. In addition to that, um, riding through stop signs, riding through traffic lights. I think the vast majority of cyclists probably are aware they should not do that but there are probably some that don't, don't know that the law that way applies to them. Yeah. So, uh, bicyclists know what they should be doing and frequently aren't. Uh, what's the next step then if education isn't doing the trick? Well, I think obviously enforcement plays a major role. I know that this past year in Salt Lake City and actually in other areas of Utah, it wasn't just Salt Lake City, but the State Department of Health, I believe it was, gave a grant to, to target certain areas um, in Utah and in each area they were given a certain amount of money to fund officers to go out and to specifically look at cyclist related traffic violations on the motorist side as well as the cyclist side so i think that that was a good step in that direction um, more of that needs to be happening it needs to come to a point where it's not requiring a special grant from the state to fund that it should be 
that should be happening in every community, every municipality as a normal course of business, not as a special target operation. And I think when that when it does come to that, it will signal that cyclists are being treated as, as a vehicle. And I think when that does happen, when it's continually being consistently enforced, I think that that will be a, a very big improvement. So what's, uh, what's the future of cycling here in, in Utah? Is it, uh, is it growing? Uh, I mean, once we get educated, well-behaved cyclists, what's it going to be like here? I think, I think it is growing. I think um, it can get nothing but better when people get more educated, motorists and bicyclists. And as long as gas keeps going up and up, I think the future is even, even brighter. I think I've noticed, in fact, more people are out and about on bicycles now that gas has gotten to about $3 a gallon. And uh, if it keeps going up higher, I think it'll be even more so. Even if it doesn't, I think that in the last few years, cycling has gone up, uh, ridership numbers have gone up, and I think it will continue to do so. We're in Omaha, Nebraska, talking with Carrie Peterson, who's executive director of our Healthy Community Partnership. What is that? Our Healthy Community Partnership is a healthy community initiative here in Omaha made up of over 31 organizations who have come together to improve the health of the community. And what have you been working on so far? Well, we've been around actually this year 10 years and we've done two community health assessments. This year, actually last year, we published our first community health report card um, for Douglas County, which told us that we weren't very healthy as Omahans here in, in Douglas County, that we had a lot of work to do. What, uh, what sort of problems did you see? Well, unlike national statistics, six out of 10 Omahans were obese and or overweight, which has huge implications for our heart disease rate, cancer rate, diabetes. We're not unlike any national statistics. And we realized through looking at this data that our community had huge economic impacts as far as our tax burden, our Medicaid dollars, the health of our citizens, that we had to do something about these ben tr bending these negative health trends that were happening. Uh, you're one of the Robert Johnson Active Living by Design communities. What are you doing in conjunction with that? I mean, you bet. Actually, timing is everything, uh, I believe. And on the heels of this report card and determining that our health really, we needed to do and make some changes in our community, the opportunity arose for us to apply for this grant. And so we did. And our um, grant, we really decided that we needed to start changing the culture of Omahans, that um, we aren't a culture that just gets out and walks to the grocery store. Um, one third of our community hasn't even used our great trail system that we have. So we decided that we wanted to launch a social marketing campaign to encourage Omahans to get out and to get active. Anybody can do it anywhere, anytime. You don't have to join a gym. Use our great city that we have to get out and reincorporate activity into a daily lifestyles. What's the secret to a successful social marketing campaign? Ah, the million dollar question. You know, we really felt two things. We wanted it to be something that anybody could associate with. We did not want to um, appeal to just youth or just seniors, um, which might actually go against social marketing um, techniques, but we wanted to make it real life and we wanted to use people from our own community. So um, we made our campaign very approachable. We shot um, scenes of people being active within our own community and doing things that involved the family, whether you were at home relaxing or if you were in the workplace, taking a walk at lunchtime, um, or that you can do it any time. And we showed our local bank with somebody in line doing jumping jacks. Um, a little stretching probably, yeah. but still getting the point that anybody can do it at any time. And we made it local, which we felt was really important. What are some of the other things you've been up to? Uh, well, the media campaign um, really wanted, we wanted that to be the backbone of what we did. And we also developed a strong website so that people knew they wanted to find out where to go to be active. Activate Omaha's website is where they could go, and we also promote things. Um, the other component is really looking at our environment here in Omaha. We are not structured to be a pedestrian-friendly um, environment, and so one of the things that we wanted to take a look at was how do we get youth more active? And one thing that was very tangible that has shown positive results in other community was the safe routes to school. Uh, in the community that we selected, about 250 students of their 600 population have to walk to school 
Um, it's just, it's, it's the re reality. How do we make that environment safe for them to walk to school so that they are getting physical activity? And so we are piloting kind of the walking school bus program where we have adult volunteers that instead of driving the carpool to work or um, just sending their kids out there on their own, we have adults that are actually picking up the youth at different spots around the school district. It's also a little different in that we're doing a five-week program, two days a week, so that we're hoping again, looking at that culture to try to make it part of the children's culture and the youth culture that they're walking to school, an environment that's safe and getting that physical activity. So that's one thing. The other thing that we're trying to look at um, is if a neighborhood wants to take a look at their environment to see what are the issues um, and the barriers to being physically active. We have um, created a neighborhood community assessment that looks at bicycle and pedestrian compatibility. And then we're also in conjunction with that developing a citizen's manual. So they will do the assessment. What do they do with the assessment results? Well, here's a citizen's manual talking about the process of policy change in our neighborhood, how to do it, who to contact and where to go to. We're hoping to um, create that on CD for other communities to use and certainly our communities here so that they have a resource to impact what's happening in their environment. If I were to come back at the end of the five-year uh, active living uh, time frame, what would you hope I'd see here in Omaha that might be different? Well, the first thing would be people getting around by bike, um, by pedestrian, hopefully plans within our um, city master plan that um, you start to see, we have a great trail system in Omaha, but it goes north and south. So anybody that's trying to get cross town by pedestrian or by alternate forms of transportation other than cars, uh, it's nearly impossible. You take your life into your own hands. So I would hope that you would come back and see the beginnings of trail system, or at least a concept for the trail system and funding and work to make that happen so that we have a couple east to west connectors. I would also hope that um, you would see people on those trail systems when you went, lots of people out there, young and old, riding their bikes, rollerblading, walking, as well as our park system. I would hope that if you were at noontime, you go downtown, you see people all over the place in their business suits or in their dress attire, walking at lunch or walking at their break time, instead of sitting up, eating their lunch at their desk, um, or just not being active. I would hope that after work time, you would see whether it's the winter, um, kids and families out having snowball fights or whether it's the summer, I would hope that you would see families out walking in our great, uh, in the great city that we do have. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.